Hi everyone, welcome to part two of this week's lecture. Now I'm gonna tell you about the thing that always makes me really excited, air circulation and climate patterns. This lecture should explain to you why we see the things we see on the surface of the earth. So uh, we're gonna be making a bunch of drawings right now. Get your colored pencils ready, be prepared to draw. I'm using, uh, I think, six or seven different colors and you're welcome to grab something like that. I think you need at least five different colors, including your main black or gray pen or pencil that you're drawing with. So get your colors ready. We're going to draw some diagrams. All right, we're going to start by talking about one of the major climate effectors on Earth, the greenhouse effect. And a lot of people think that the greenhouse effect is always bad, but it's not the greenhouse effect that is actually what allows us to survive on Earth even when the sun goes down and it gets cold. Uh, it doesn't get too cold enough to kill us thanks to the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect insulates the Earth. And this is because greenhouse gases are warming the lower atmosphere. And I'm going to show you exactly how that happens. So we're going to set up a little drawing here. Go ahead and draw a ground at the bottom of your paper, a little sun in the upper right hand corner. I'll draw a layer near the top, label that atmosphere. That's like the outer boundary of our atmosphere. And then a little further down, that's the ozone layer. That's uh, part of the middle of our atmosphere. And we'll talk about what that does in a moment. And I just filled up our atmosphere with molecules. What are these molecules? These are all greenhouse gas molecules. I'll turn off my video so you can see all of my labels. There we go. Uh, these are all greenhouse gas molecules. These aren't the only molecules in our atmosphere, but they are the important ones for now. So I'm, they're the only ones I'm representing. These make up about 25% of our atmosphere. Most of our atmosphere is uh, non-reactive molecules like nitrogen gas, especially. But the greenhouse gases that I have represented here, you can see my key on the right. Uh, the most common greenhouse gas is water vapor. And we don't talk about this one too much because humans don't have a big impact on the amount of water vapor, but it is by far the most common greenhouse gas. We also have carbon dioxide and methane. And so let's take a look at how all of this works together. I'm gonna be representing uh, two forms of energy in my diagram, and they need to be different colors. I'm gonna be drawing UV radiation with yellow and infrared radiation with red. And these are just two different forms of energy. So UV radiation is the energy that comes in to our atmosphere directly from the sun. This is high energy radiation, and most of it, as you can see from the first line I just drew, comes in through the atmosphere, hits the ozone layer, gets reflected off, and bounces right back out into space. And this is fantastic. Uh, UV radiation, that high energy radiation, would tear us up if all of it could make its way down uh, to the ground. UV radiation tears giant pieces out of DNA. So we don't want to be exposed to too much of it. And thankfully, the ozone layer reflects about 98% of the UV radiation that comes in from the sun. Thank you, ozone layer. We got to keep you strong. Uh, but about 2% of UV radiation does make it through the ozone layer to the ground. So we can draw a couple rays making it to the ground. And now what I want you to notice first is that that UV radiation didn't interact with any of those greenhouse gases. It just made its way through the atmosphere, through the ozone layer, hit the ground, and it actually gets absorbed by the ground. And now think back to the first and second law of thermodynamics. Energy is not created or destroyed. It just changes form. And we're going to see a change of energy form here. The UV radiation that's absorbed by the ground or a solid surface like a building or a car is absorbed. And then it's re-emitted back into the environment as a different form of energy as infrared energy. And now I'm using my second drawing color. I'm in red right now for infrared. Uh, and this particular ray of infrared radiation got emitted from the ground and just kind of wiggled its way back out into space. And now here's the important thing about infrared radiation, and you might want to add this to your label over here. Infrared radiation is not just high energy radiation. It's kind of medium energy. Most importantly, infrared radiation is heat. And if you've ever seen video from an infrared camera, 
this makes sense to you. You've seen those pictures on an infrared camera of people kind of being found in the woods or lighting up um, because we're looking for heat signatures with our infrared cameras. Infrared radiation is what we perceive as heat. And so this particular ray of infrared radiation of heat is not staying in the atmosphere for very long. It's just kind of immediately going out into space. So this isn't going to warm up the earth very much. But infrared radiation will bounce off of greenhouse gases. And so what about the infrared radiation that comes out of here? It's got a bunch of greenhouse gases right in its way. How is it going to go out to the atmosphere? Well, it's a lot like a pinball in a pinball machine. As it hits a greenhouse gas, it rebounds off, rebounds off, and eventually makes its way out into space. The longer it stays rebounding off of these greenhouse gases, the longer it stays in the lower atmosphere, and the more warmth is in the lower atmosphere. So the longer we can keep this infrared radiation in the lower atmosphere, the warmer it will be. And this is good. Uh, this means that heat is trapped on Earth even when the sun goes down. If these greenhouse gases weren't there and the sun went down, all of the infrared radiation that was on the surface of the Earth would be lost to space immediately and everything on Earth would freeze solid each night. So it's good that we have some greenhouse gases. But you have heard about the greenhouse gases being, or the greenhouse effect as being a negative thing. And it is when humans get involved. So I'm going to add something to my diagram. And you're welcome to either add this to your diagram or to draw a separate diagram representing this situation. If you haven't represented these greenhouse gases as like little dots on your diagram yet, you probably want to. Because now something's changed. And if you haven't noticed, the thing that changed was there's a bunch more greenhouse gases in the lower atmosphere now. Specifically, I didn't change the number of water vapor molecules at all because humans aren't particularly involved in that. That's mostly due to the natural water cycle. But I did add a bunch more carbon dioxide molecules. We're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in much higher concentrations than it's ever been seen because we are burning fossil fuels. Uh, I added a couple methanes as well. We're adding methane to the atmosphere through industrial agriculture. And now look how clogged up that space is. Let's send in our UV radiation one more time and see what happens. Okay, remember most of our UV radiation hits the ozone layers reflected into outer space. Some of our UV radiation can make its way to the ground. Notice that the UV radiation is just going through these greenhouse gases. It's not interacting with them at all. It's not reflected. Be careful about that when you explain this back to me or Mr. Sachs on your test. Um, but the infrared radiation that's going to be re-emitted from the ground, that will be bounced around off of these greenhouse gas molecules. So take a look at the crazy paths that our infrared radiation is going to take now. Watch it hit all of these greenhouse gas molecules pinball around off of them before it can finally make its way back out into space. It's just bouncing around, bouncing around. And the process of this infrared radiation bouncing around these greenhouse gas molecules, this takes time. And this means that this infrared radiation, this heat, will be trapped in the lower atmosphere for much longer than it used to be. And so to understand what's going on here, think about what happens when you put on a down coat in the winter. That coat isn't heated. There's no electric blanket in there. All it's doing is trapping the heat that your body is creating and preventing that heat from escaping to the environment. That's what these greenhouse gas molecules are doing too. They're just trapping the heat and preventing it from escaping out into space. So the longer it's trapped, the hotter it will be. And the more greenhouse gas molecules we add, the hotter things will be. Okay, so that's the greenhouse effect. And that is the first of our climate phenomena that we're going to talk about. Uh, now let's take a look at the phenomena that underlie where we see our biomes. Oh yeah, I added a little summary sentence I forgot about. Anthropogenic, that means human-caused, addition of greenhouse gases increases the time that infrared radiation spends in the lower atmosphere. That's what we just talked about. We're good. Okay, so now I want to explain to you this crazy biome phenomenon. We talked about biomes before, and what I want you to notice is how biomes are arranged. They're arranged in these latitude stripes. All taiga is found at just about the same latitude, at about 60 north. 
all tropical rainforest is found at just about the same latitude, right around zero, right around the equator. All tundra is found at the same latitude, real far up north here at about 75 north. Why on earth could that be the case? Well, we got to talk about what determines different biomes, what creates different biomes. They're all based on their climate. From our last video on biomes, you should remember that they've all got specific patterns of temperature, of precipitation, and that's really what defines the biome. Temperature plus precipitation, that's the climate of the biome. So let's break that down again. Climate is two things, temperature and precipitation. And now we have to ask ourselves, well, what determines the temperature of the biome? And there's two things that determine temperatures of biomes latitude and altitude. So latitude, how far north or south of the equator we are, and altitude, how far off the Earth's surface we are. The second part, precipitation, is actually a little more complicated. Uh, temperature kind of changes evenly as we go north or south of the equator. Precipitation doesn't. We see bands of high precipitation, bands of low precipitation. Uh, it's based around patterns in air circulation patterns in water circulation, and also the presence or absence of mountains. So let's go through each of these. First, let's start with temperature. The first thing that matters is latitude, how far north or south of the equator we are. Why does that matter? This new term called insolation, not insulation, I didn't misspell it, that's insolation, SOL, sol, means sun. This means how much solar energy is each latitude getting because each latitude gets a particular amount of solar energy and it changes how depending on how far north or south of the equator you are. So here's our little map showing how much solar energy is being absorbed by the ground. And you can see here at the equator, the most solar energy is being absorbed. Further north, we see a little less solar energy being absorbed. Further south, less solar energy is being absorbed. And then the furthest north we can go, uh, less very little solar energy is absorbed here and here, and we've got extremely low levels of solar energy being absorbed there in Antarctica because all of that ice is actually reflecting a lot of the UV radiation. Okay, the other thing that mattered for temperature was altitude or elevation. Why does that matter? Well, think about any experience you've ever had on a mountain or looking at a mountain. It gets colder when you go higher. It's cold, it's snowy on top of Mount Everest. Uh, if we take a look at this map of biomes, one thing I want you to notice is this funky stripe, this light blue stripe of tundra that you see going down the North America and down South America, and you see tundra like right at the equator. That should be kind of shocking. How's it possible that there's tundra there? Well, it's because there's mountain ranges there. Uh, these little stripes of tundra, these are the Andes Mountains. These are the Rocky Mountains. And think back to our plate tectonics for why we see the Andes Mountains, why we see the Rocky Mountains. We've got some plate boundaries there. Uh, but what's important is the elevation. These mountains are so high that near the tops of these mountains, it is cold enough that we see not tropical rainforest, we see tundra. It's really, really cold and fairly dry. Okay, now we're going to take a look at precipitation. And precipitation, whew, there's a lot of rules, but once you understand them, you're going to be like, oh man, that's how the world works. This is amazing. So I want to teach you the three rules of air circulation. And with these three rules, you can reverse engineer the entire process. So pay close attention, write them down. Rule number one, warm air rises. You're familiar with this one. Rule number two, cool air sinks. You're also familiar with this one. This is our, remember I said this was our theme for today. Magma does the same thing. Hot things rise, cool things sink. This is important. So let's take a look at the second half of each of these sentences, stuff about pressure zones. I want you to imagine the air, the molecules themselves in the air, as those warm air molecules rise off the ground. What are they leaving behind them? Well, if they're all rising off of the ground, they're leaving behind empty space. And that empty space with all of those molecules now really spread out, that's going to be a low pressure zone. So when warm air rises, we're going to have a low pressure zone formed right here near the Earth's surface. 
Now, what about cool air sinking? When cool air sinks, again, picture the molecules. Picture all of those molecules in cool air smushing down on top of each other, getting closer and closer, packed together. And when those molecules are packed together, ooh, they're under pressure. That's a high pressure zone that's formed when our cool air sinks. So let's link these two. What's the link between them? Well, rule number three, air moves from high pressure to low pressure. So think about just right now what's going to happen. We've got a high pressure zone near the surface of the earth here. We've got a low pressure zone near the surface of the earth here. We're going to see some air movement whew, like that from right to left. And that'll be wind. That will be some of our surface wind. All wind on earth is created by air moving from high pressure to low pressure. Whoosh. Okay, so with these three rules, let's take a look at the earth. And we need to start by drawing an earth. So you're probably going to want like half a page for this. Kind of set up your page like, like I have so that the <clears throat> earth is taking up um, the one side of it and you've got some space over here where you can draw some other stuff. And now we're going to divide this earth into latitude bands. We're going to start by drawing just a line across the middle. This is our zero latitude, the equator, label it with me. And then we're going to draw our latitude bands at 30, 60, and 90 north. So I drew two more horizontal lines to split my space into thirds. I labeled them 30 north, 60 north, 90 north. And now I'm going to do the same thing in the southern hemisphere. Now I've got 30 south, 60 south, and 90 south. And here's my globe. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use four different colors. You can use the same colors as me or different colors. I have one color for rising warm wet air. That's red. I'm using blue for falling cool dry air. Orange for simplified surface winds. And hot pink for actual surface winds. All right, we are ready. So on our little Earth, the first thing I want you to note is where we have the most incoming solar radiation. And that's definitely right here at the equator. Good rule of thumb. Everything I write, you write. Everything I draw, you draw. So go ahead and label the equator most incoming solar radiation. And what that means is we have the most heat energy right here and all of our water right here around the equator, it's going to be getting nice and warm. Our air is going to be getting nice and warm. A lot of that water, that warm water will be evaporating into the air. We've got lots of warm, wet air right here at the equator. And what do warm things do? They rise. And so this is showing warm air rising off the surface of the earth. So uh, into a higher and higher altitude into the atmosphere. And that warm, wet air as it's rising, well, remember what we just said about altitude? As we go up in altitude, things cool down. So that warm air, that warm, wet air is rising and it's getting cooler and cooler until the water vapor that's in it condenses and precipitates down as rain. And so we're actually going to see a ton of rainfall right here at the equator. Anywhere we see rising air, that rising air will be bringing water vapor with it. The water vapor, write this down, this is super important. The water vapor will cool as it rises, the water vapor will condense, and then it'll precipitate down as rain. Uh, oops. Now thinking about what's gonna happen to that air next, when it gets super high, it's really cold. And what do cold things do? they sink. So eventually our cool air will get so cold that it'll start sinking uh, and it'll start sinking down here at 30 north and 30 south. And you might be wondering why doesn't it just sink right back down to the equator? Well remember there's still more warm air rising here and so there's like constantly a conveyor belt of air pushing up, 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 pushing up, 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 up. The cool air just can't sink. It's just being pushed up by this rising warm air. And so the first place that the cool dry air can sink is pushed north here to 30 north or pushed south here to 30 south. Now this air that's falling, remember, has lost all of its precipitation. It's lost all of its water vapor already. So it's super dry. It's also really cold, which is why it's sinking down. Let's take a look at the pressure zones that are created. 
underneath our rising warm wet air, we're leaving all those <laughs> molecules, uh, sorry, we're taking all those molecules with us up into the atmosphere, leaving a bunch of empty space. That's our low pressure zone. And then here at 30 north and 30 south, where our air is sinking and the molecules are packing down on top of each other, those are our high pressure zones. So pick up your orange or whatever you're using in place of orange to show our simplified surface winds. We know what's going to happen. Air moves from high pressure to low pressure. So air should move like this. We should have surface winds that blow south from 30 north to the equator and north from 30 south to the equator. And if you're like, but wait, what about this actual surface winds thing? I'll get there. Hold on. We're going to stick with simplified surface winds for now. So take a look at this nice little air circulation pattern. Warm air rises from the equator, water vapor cools, condenses, precipitates, the remaining air is dry and cool and can eventually fall at 30 north or south, and it gets pushed from the high pressure zone to our low pressure zone here, and our air just keeps circulating and circulating and circulating and circulating. These are two air circulation cells, and they have a name, these are called Hadley cells after the person who first discovered them. These were the first air circulation cells discovered on Earth, but there's actually two more sets. So let's turn our attention to a different part of the Earth, not the equator, but the poles. At the poles, we don't have the most incoming solar radiation. We have the least incoming solar radiation. So here at the poles, it's super cold. And what does cold air do? it sinks. So at both 90 north and 90 south, we have falling, cool, dry air. And that falling, cool, dry air is going to smush a bunch of molecules all together. We're going to have high pressure zones here at 90 north and 90 south. So our air wants to move away from this high pressure zone. And here in the North Pole, it's got only one direction to go. It's got to go south. There is no north. So our air will always move from north to south here and from south to north at the south pole. Uh, what's going to happen next? To understand what happens next, we actually have to look back to Hadley cell because this falling dry air that descends at 30 north, well, we know it goes from high to low pressure, so it goes whoosh like that, but there's another way it could go. It doesn't have to go south. It could also go north. It just wants to get away from this high pressure zone. So it could go south to get away, or it could go north to get away. Same thing down here. Our air at 30 south wants to get away from this high pressure zone, so it can go north, or it can go south, and it does. So we have some surface wind going north from 30 north and going south from 30 south. And now look at the collision of these two prevailing surface winds. Think about them as two convergent plates, two convergent continental plates about to smash together. What's going to happen? Well, they're going to smash together and they're going to push each other upward. As they smash together, they push each other upward. And now we have air rising here at 60 north and at 60 south. And anywhere we have rising air, we know what's going to happen. That rising air has water vapor in it. As it rises, the water vapor cools, condenses, and precipitates down as rain. We've got a lot of rain at 60 north and 60 south. And as our air continues to rise, continues to cool until it eventually falls back down as cool, dry air. And it can fall back down in this direction or we know what'll happen next, it'll fall back down here as well. Falling cool dry air. And I added in one more uh, pressure zone right here underneath our rising warm wet air. We've got our low pressure zone here, our low pr pressure zone down here. Uh, and that completes our air circulation pattern. We've got three cells, three air circulation cells here in the Northern hemisphere, three in the South. The other two have names as well. Our two middle circulation cells, these are called feral cells. And our two polar cells are called polar cells. They weren't named after a person. So think about what this means. This means that most of the air between 30 and 60 north just kind of stays there. It's just constantly circulating, 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 circulating in this little, little bubble. And there's not a huge amount of global 
air circulation. And air circulation happens in these 30 degree bands. It also shows us precipitation patterns. It shows us where we've got heavy bands of precipitation, zero, 60 north, 60 south, and where we've got virtually no precipitation or super dry zones, 30 north, 30 south, 60 north, and 60 south. So now let's take a look at our biomes. Does this explain our biomes? Yes, it does. At the equator at zero degrees, highest insulation, super high uh, amounts of rising warm wet air, so super high precipitation, really hot, lots of rain. Rainforests are found at the equator. What about at 30 north and south? That's where we have our falling cool dry air and quite a bit of sun, we see our driest biomes there are deserts. Our next band of heavy precipitation, 60 north and south, that's at uh, where our two um, prevailing surface winds smash into each other and rise. We see wet biomes there, deciduous forests and our taiga. We see taiga at 60, we see our deciduous forest usually a little south of that. Uh, and then finally, our driest biome, our Arctic tundra, super cold, super dry, we see that here at this other area of dry, cool, falling air. So this explains things. It also explains precipitation patterns. It's all linked. Uh, here at the equator, we see our highest band of precipitation, 30 north, 30 south, low bands of precipitation, super, super dry. Here's our 60 north, 60 south band of precipitation again, and then 90 north, 90 south bands of very, very dry uh, climate. Okay, so now let's take a look at the winds because you drew the simplified surface winds, but now we need to figure out what the actual surface winds are, and I'm gonna show you what I mean. So let's start by either on your same model of an earth, um, or on a new little earth that you draw, pause the video, draw a new earth with these same latitude labels. Um, I want you to draw all of the pressure zones and I want you to draw them right down the center of the earth. So our low pressure at the equator, high pressure at 30 north and 30 south, low pressure at 60 north and 60 south, and high pressure at the poles. Okay, and so now let's use these pressure zones to draw our simplified surface winds. Okay, we know if we go from high to low, 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 high to low. Okay, so what this is telling us is that between 30 north and zero, we should always see winds blowing straight to the south. And in this latitude band, we should always see our winds blowing straight to the north. Well, is that what we see? No. Not at all. This is a map of the prevailing winds on Earth, and what we see is a lot of diagonals. Uh, I see almost no winds that are blowing straight north or straight south. We see in this band a lot of winds that are kind of blowing towards the southwest from the northeast. Here I see a lot of winds that are blowing towards the no northwest from the southeast. So what's going on here? Well, if we look at this simplified surface wind model, we have to take into account something, specifically the spin of the Earth. The Earth is constantly spinning, and it's spinning whoosh, like that, whoosh. Uh, and the spin of the Earth actually makes everything around the equator move faster than around the poles, because everything around the equator has to spin really fast to just make it around in the same amount of time that everything at the poles does. So what this does is it produces something called the Coriolis effect. And the Coriolis effect um, is more complex than just what I've written, but this is the important thing for you to know. For our purposes, the Coriolis effect means that winds will curve due to the rotation of the earth. And here's the little trick that I wanna give you to figure out how they're gonna curve. Things closer to the equator are moving faster and are therefore pulled westward with the spin of the Earth. So let's take a look at what that means for the purposes of wind. Look at this arrow, it's pointing down, so our wind is blowing down. Uh, now things closer to the equator are pulled westward, which means that the tip of this arrow closer to the equator will be pulled westward 
and our actual wind direction will look like this. That's what we saw on the map. Our winds in this latitude band are actually blowing mostly towards the southwest from the northeast. Wow, amazing. Looking at this arrow, is that what I wanted to do next? Yeah, uh, the tip is closer to the equator. That's pulled. Ooh, that's pulled towards the west, and so these winds are blowing in a. This is tricky. Winds are actually named for the area they're coming from. So we would say these winds are blowing in a southeasterly direction, which really means that they're blowing towards the northwest. Uh, now, same deal, taking a look at this arrow, which side is closer to the equator, this edge. So we would pull it to the west. And there it is. Our winds are actually going to be blowing this way. Same deal in the southern hemisphere. This edge is pulled to the west. And same deal in the polar regions, our uh, more equatorial edge is pulled towards the west, and we have winds blowing towards the northwest, towards the southwest, which means that this is a <laughs> northeasterly wind up here. So these are the real prevailing wind directions. And what's incredible is that almost all of the prevailing winds in this latitude band are blowing towards the southwest. Almost all the winds in this latitude band are blowing towards the northeast. And so these are all called trade winds. These are the prevailing surface winds that are always blowing on Earth. And the ones in this latitude band from zero to 30 north or 30 south, these are called the northeast trade winds or the southeast trade winds. And remember, they're named based on the direction the wind is coming from. So this wind is coming from the northeast, it's the northeast trade wind. This wind is coming from the southeast, it's the southeast trade wind. These winds are called the westerlies because they're blowing from the west. And then these ones are called the polar easterlies because they're in the polar latitude, latitudes and they're blowing from the east. So now let's take a look at how this matches with the actual prevailing wind pattern on Earth. Do our westerlies actually exist between 30 north and 60 north? They do! Check this out. The winds in this band, except for some weird <laughs> ones there, which we'll ignore, most of the winds in this band are blowing towards the northeast. These are our westerly prevailing winds. We did it. We explained wind patterns on Earth. Pretty awesome. So quick little recap. Um, our prevailing winds on Earth are determined by this tricell model. So we've got a tricellular model, Hadley cell, Ferrell cell, polar cell, three cells. The tricellular model, along with the Coriolis effect, creates these prevailing wind directions. The tricellular model moves air in the north-south direction, and then the Coriolis effect moves air in the east-west direction, and so we have these winds that are kind of going in diagonals, our northeast trade winds and our southeast trade winds, for example. Okay, so this is pretty awesome, um, but we have to look at more than just the prevailing winds. When wind is blowing over water, it pushes it. And so we have a lot of water circulation to consider. Water circulation uh, is seen all over the globe through the ocean conveyor belt. And this ocean conveyor belt is determined by two things, wind, blowing air in a particular direction, and also the same hot, hot water rising, cool water sinking phenomena that we've heard multiple other times today. Warm things rise, cool things sink. So generally, the warmer the water is, uh, the more the water will evaporate, which will generate more precipitation. So can you explain why England right here is so rainy? Well, look at all of this warm water that's been heated up by the sun on the surface of the water, heated up by the sun, 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 finally reaches England. Ooh, all of that warm water is definitely going to rise. As it rises higher and higher, it cools, condenses, and precipitates down as rain. There's England. Uh, cold water is more dense, so it sinks, and that's what drives this ocean conveyor belts, moving water through the entire globe, through all of the Earth's oceans in this constant conveyor belt, driving water circulation all over the globe. And for our purposes, you don't need to know the path of this ocean conveyor belt, just that it's something that exists and just that most of the warm, uh, most of the water movement on Earth has to do with uh, the different temperatures and densities of the water. 
okay one reminder we already talked about this the uneven heating of the sun on earth's surface is what drives the movement of both air and water because the sun creates those high and low pressure systems that move the air and then the sun makes some water less dense by warming it up and some water more dense by not warming it up and that drives water circulation as well so it all comes back to one of our principles of sustainability the sun so couple more effects, two more effects. The rain shadow effect is a big one. Um, this has to do with mountains. Remember I said that there were three things that impact precipitation patterns, air circulation, uh, ooh, water circulation, and mountains. Here's the mountains. So what I'd like you to draw is a mountain and I'd like, like you to label one side of it, the coast. This is something that we see on mountains by coastal regions, not inland mountains, but mountains by coastal regions. Uh, when air, oh, here are my two colors that I'm gonna use. Same deal, red for warm, wet air, blue for cool, dry air, get your colors ready, make your key. When air blows in from the coast, uh, it's just been traveling over all of this water. That water vapor was evaporating into this air. This air is full of water vapor. And it may not be particularly warm, but what we care about is how wet this air is. As it blows in from the coast, it's going to approach the mountain. What's going to happen when it hits this giant mountain? Can't go through the mountain. It's going to be forced up. And we know what happens when air rises, when this air is being pushed up, just like we've seen before, as altitude increases, temperature drops. So this rising air will cool down, the water vapor will condense into clouds and will precipitate down as rain. And so the rain shadow effect, the first part of it you're seeing here, here's the rain part. Uh, the rain shadow effect starts by having very heavy precipitation on the side of mountains by the coast where the prevailing wind is coming in. So our air is still being pushed up and pushed up, and now it's really lost its water vapor. So it's it's just rising air now and it's dry. We also know that it's getting colder and colder, so it's going to hit the top of the mountain and it's going to start falling. Our cool, dry air will start falling and it's going to fall and just continue down on its path. So what this means is that the two sides of the mountain are going to have extremely different biomes. Uh, this in climates, the this side of the mountain will have very wet climate. The side of the mountain will have a much cooler and drier climate. And it means that we can see extremely different biomes right next to each other in a fairly small space. So these two sides of the mountain have a name, have different names. Oops, try not to cover it up. This left side by the coast where the wind is coming in and this side is the wet side. Uh, this is the windward side. This other side of the mountain is the leeward side. And so on the windward side, the mountains force the wet air up, which cools it down. When it cools, the water condenses and falls on the windward side, which is facing the prevailing winds. So these are the prevailing winds coming in. On the leeward side, the air has lost all of its moisture and it continues over the mountain, creating desert conditions on the leeward side of the mountain. So we can see here on the windward side, forest biome, uh, really, really water heavy biomes. On the leeward side, we see deserts. And let me show you three real examples, courtesy of Google Earth. Here's your first example. These are the Andes Mountains highlighted in yellow. And what I want you to notice is the Amazon basin on this side and the Atacama Desert, one of the driest zones on earth, right here just on the other side of the Andes Mountains. How can these coexist so closely? Rainforest, super dry desert. Well, you might be able to figure out which side the prevailing winds are coming from, coming this way. And if you looked at your wind map, you should also figure it out. This is right around the equator. And so we know our prevailing winds are coming whew, towards the west. And so we're bringing all of that warm, wet air this way. It rises over the Andes, cools, condenses, precipitates down right around here. This fuels a lot of the water of the Amazon basin. And that means that the Atacama Desert is totally dry. They don't get any of that water because it was forced out on the windward side. Here are the Sierra Nevadas. So take a look. There's our Sierra Nevada mountain range. Look at our uh, 
forest biome over here, our desert biome over here. Which way are the winds going? Like this. So they're coming up, they're hitting the Sierra Nevadas, rising, cooling, condensing, precipitating down. We get a super uh, wet biome over here, extremely dry biome over here. One more example, the Himalayas. Look at this. We see this incredibly green landscape down here and dry, dry plateau up here by the Himalayas. And it's not just dry because it's high up. It's dry because of the rain shadow effect. Prevailing winds are coming this way. They hit the Himalayas, rise, cool, condense, precipitate. We get all of our water forced out on the windward side. Leeward side is super dry. Isn't that so cool? Now you can explain why you see deserts in some area, forests in other areas. So cool. Okay, one last climate phenomenon to explain, and it's a big one, El Nino. Okay, I'm going to have you set up your paper to draw El Nino, and you got to do it in a particular way. I need you to draw a box like I have. Take your time draw your box. It's important that it's 3D because what this is going to represent is the surface of the ocean here and then this is going to be like the ocean deeps and then there's the ocean floor. So we actually got to see, you know, the whole depth of the ocean there. And on this box you're going to draw a couple continents and it can be bad drawings like mine are. Right here we actually see the tip of Indonesia. Here we see Australia. Aus means Australia. And then on the other side, we see South America. So you can also label the ocean that you're looking at. What ocean is this? The Pacific Ocean. And where on earth are we? Well, locate the equator. The equator is right under this little blop coming off of the west coast of South America. So our equator is right about here. Okay, and you're actually going to draw one more box that looks like that and a third. You need three boxes, even though I've only got two on the screen. So set up your paper, make yourself three beautiful boxes that look just like this. And on the first one, you can go ahead and label this the normal pattern. This is where we're going to draw what happens in a normal year. In the second box, you can label it El Nino pattern. And the third box will be La Nina, but we'll get there in a second. So let's start with the normal pattern. What happens in this region of the globe in a normal year? Well, prevailing surface winds. Which way are they going? Quick, quick, quick. Check your prevailing surface winds diagram. Remember, this is actual, not simplified. Actual prevailing surface winds. What do they look like in this region of the globe? You're going to have to be able to figure this out in a moment. Well, this is right by the equator. Our prevailing surface winds around here are roughly going to the west. We've got some... Uh, Northeast trade winds coming down here, southeast trade winds coming up here. And so just all together, they're pushing wind and water this way. And what's important is that as the winds are blowing this way, they're pushing water along with them too. And they're pushing all the water that's at the top of the ocean. That makes sense. And so all this nice warm water that's at the top of the ocean, heated up by the sun, it's being pushed, 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 pushed until it hits a wall. And the wall is Indonesia and Australia. And so we get all of this warm water that's physically pushed over here. It literally piles up. We have higher seas over here because of how the water is piling up. But all of that warm, wet water, <laughs> warm, wet water, is going to be not just staying warm itself. It's going to be heating up the air around it. And all of that uh, warm water is going to be evaporating. And that warm air is going to be rising as well. Warm, wet air is going to be significantly rising right here at this warm water pileup between Indonesia and Australia. So we know what's going to happen here. This will be a low pressure zone. Our warm, wet air will rise. The water vapor will cool, condense, precipitate. Rain. We see a ton of rain in Indonesia and northern Australia. These are very wet regions of the globe. Now our, our rising air cools, loses its water vapor, and now it's dry and it's cold and it's eventually going to fall. Where is it going to fall? Well, it can't fall back down here. Remember, there's more warm air rising below it. So it gets pushed off until it can finally fall right over here over South America. And this is right around Peru and Argentina. And so what we see over here in a normal year is some pretty cool, dry, extremely dry conditions. There's one other thing that's happening, and it's happening below the surface of the ocean. This is pretty crazy. As all of that water is being pushed physically off the coast of South America, 
we have like a gap. We have more water over here than over here. And so water doesn't like that. Water's not cool with being at an angle. And so water is from the deep ocean is actually going to rise up. It's going to move all the way. There's my arrow. It's going to move all the way from the ocean bottom up to fill this gap in the water column that was created over here on the coast of South America. And this is fabulous because all of this water moving up, it's super chilly, but what's important is that it's full of nutrients. The ocean floor is chock full of nutrients. We have all sorts of dead decomposing stuff at the bottom of the ocean floor that's just got all sorts of nitrogen and phosphorus in it. And when that rises up, that fuels a ton of uh, phytoplankton growth and then zooplankton growth, fish growth, bird growth, and it fuels some major ecosystems right here. Okay, quick summary. In a normal year, it is wet and rainy in Indonesia and Northern Australia. It is dry in Peru and Argentina here on the West Coast of South America. And there is upwelling. This is called upwelling off the coast of Peru and Argentina. Okay, so those are normal conditions. And what happens in an El Nino year? Well, El Nino is this very unusual climate phenomenon that we don't even know how to predict. It happens every seven to 14 years, but there's variation. It could be a 10 year gap one time, an 11 year gap another time, seven to 14 years. Uh, and in an El Nino year, the prevailing surface winds actually stop or even switch directions, which is kind of unbelievable. When this happens, and it only happens in this very unique area of the globe, when this happens, everything gets messed up because now we're not pushing any water to Indonesia and Australia anymore. Now it's getting slightly pushed towards South America. Really what mostly happens is we have most of our warm water just kind of right here in the middle of the Pacific. And so we're gonna see our rising warm wet hair right here in the middle of the Pacific. Our, our water vapor will rise with that air. The water vapor will cool, condense, precipitate down. Uh-oh, we've got rain happening here near the coast of South America that used to be super dry. Uh, and then that air cools. It's dry now. It lost its water vapor. It falls right around here. Oh no, now we've got no rain over here. And what about upwelling? Well, there's not a lot of water being blown one way or another, so we don't have a gap in the water column. We're not missing any water here, so upwelling stops. Quick summary, in an El Nino year, it's super dry in the Western Pacific, and we get things like wildfires. We see bad wildfires in an El Nino year because of the loss of rain. Over here in South America, ton of rain in a desert biome, we're gonna get floods. We see major floods in Peru and Argentina in an El Nino year. And we see no upwelling. Remember what I said about the good thing about upwelling, how it brought all those nutrients with it? Think about what happens to the ecosystems that depend on those nutrients for the base of their food web. We're gonna see major ecosystem collapse. We're gonna see fisheries collapse. We might see economic, uh, negative economic outcomes from that too, big, so what about La Nina? Well, La Nina is, I labeled it here. Make sure you've drawn your third box, labeled it La Nina pattern. La Nina is the normal pattern, but stronger. So these prevailing surface winds, they strengthen, they get extra strong and we blow a ton of wind this way and we push a ton of water that way. So we have a huge warm water pile up there, a lot of uh, warm wet air rising, even more precipitation than normal, our cool air sinking, even drier than normal. And what about our upwelling? Well, we're pushing off even more water from our coast, so we're gonna have even more upwelling happening. And we, we may see some negative outcomes like this. Like we can still see floods over here or major droughts over here. So it's you know not all fantastic to strengthen this pattern, um, but it's typically not as severe as an El Nino year. All right, last thing, one more recap of why upwelling is important. So our surface winds, now this is just another view of what's happening. Our surface winds are pushing our surface water away from an area. And so that water moves offshore and our deeper, colder nutrient with rich water rises to replace the water that was pushed away. And as it's rising, it's 
bringing up all of these nutrients that were at the bottom of the ocean floor. And those nutrients really fuel the food web. They increase the primary productivity, growth of algae and plants, of aquatic ecosystems. So this has ramifications all the way up the food web um, and definitely impacts commercial fish that, that we fish for food, um, for bait fish, etc. Oh, okay. So those are the climate patterns that you need to know. I hope this was eye-opening. I hope you can feel like you can look at Google Earth and understand why you see the biome um, spreads that you do, why you see desert one place, forest another place, why you see huge amounts of productivity in certain areas and not in others. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching, everybody.